plus the 792, 936,000, that's where we're at at four. The factory overhead, that ties out to the trial balance over here, factory overhead. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it for the 936. Then we have the overhead rate uh, is on direct labor out percentage of direct labor hours. So we have the direct labor used is 780. So if we take a look at this transaction, we're gonna have the 936. How are we calculating that? Well, we had the direct labor from our last transaction. So if we have our last transaction here in the work in process, this 780,000 was for direct labor. So if we take the 780,000 times our percentage, which is 1.2, we come up to 936. So you might be asking, well, why would we do that? Why are we allocating the direct labor? So let's think about that. That's where we come up with the number. Why do we have this 120 and why is it based on uh, the direct labor? So remember that our, our idea here is that we're allocating out the factory overhead to the uh, work in process accounts. And if there were multiple accounts, we got to determine where to put the work in process. In order to do that, we're going to use a predetermined rate. Usually that rate will be based on the prior year's numbers. So it's generally going to be a, an estimate based on prior year's numbers. The reason you, we use direct labor is because direct labor is usually a good cost driver to tell us how much should be allocated to a particular area because the direct labor is usually a good indication of the ratio that should be allocated to one area or another. So that's so note that when we allocate out the factory overhead, based on something like direct labor, uh, the two things, direct labor has nothing to do with factory overhead. Direct labor has already been recorded separately. It's not like we're recording the direct labor. We're using direct labor in order to help us to allocate the factory overhead. All right, so then we got the uh, next transaction. Work in process inventory is uh, 533. Now we're gonna calculate out the cost of goods manufactured. So the cost of goods that we've made if we're thinking about a company where we purchase stuff and then sell stuff, when we think about the cost of goods sold, a different formula, we have purchases. We have the beginning inventory plus purchases. We, when we make things, we don't have purchases. We have the stuff that we made. So when we get to the cost of goods sold formula, we're going to talk about uh, when we get to that piece that has purchases in it, we're going to have to substitute for purchases the cost of goods manufactured and therefore we need this whole other worksheet to have cost of goods manufactured. Now the cost of goods manufactured is not the same thing as the cost of goods sold. We'll look at the cost of goods sold next. We need this calculation, cost of goods manufactured, in order to do the cost of goods sold calculation, which we will do uh, in next time, next slide. All right, so so what in, what's gonna be included in the inventory, the stuff that we've made, the cost of the goods that we manufactured? Well, we have the direct labor that we put into there. And we can see this, this is our work in process. So what's in work in process, direct labor. Here's our calculation for direct labor. We've got, uh, I'm sorry, this is direct materials, then direct labor. So here's the direct labor. So here's the direct materials, here's the direct labor. And then we have the overhead. Here's the overhead. Here's the overhead in our uh, work in process account on the general ledger. This is our general ledger account. Those are the three things you always want to think about when you think of inventory. Especially if we're making the inventory, we know directly that we actually put in direct materials, direct labor, overhead. If we're purchasing inventory, we have to, we should realize when we see an inventory, when we see like a TV or something, we should be saying, yeah, well, that's not just plastic, that's direct material, that's direct labor, that's overhead that's going into the cost of that. So it's good to get that in, in your mind when we're a manufacturing company, that's clear. Clearly that that's the case because that happens within that company. If it's in multiple companies, then that just happened at different stages of, along the way. So the manufacturing costs added during the month, if we add those up, 1,935,000 
Then we're going to add to that the beginning work in process. And that brings us to a total uh, cost and work in process of 2,349,500. Then we're going to subtract out of that the ending work in process, the 533. We were given this number. We'll talk a bit later when we talk about the um, equivalent units and whatnot on, on the allocation of, of uh, these, these numbers and how we would come up with that number at a later time. We're just looking at the flow this at this point. And that will give us then the cost of goods manufactured. So now we have the cost of goods manufactured. Again, this would be kind of like purchases when we get to the cost of goods formula. Uh, and when we make stuff, we have to calculate how much of the cost of the stuff that we manufactured. Okay, so now that we have our cost of goods manufactured journal entry, that's that's the stuff we made. We've determined the stuff that we made so we can remove the stuff from the finished goods. We can take a look at our, our journal entry from, I'm sorry, the work in process to the finished goods. So our journal entry would be debit to finished goods for the 1816 We're going to credit the work in process for the 1816 five here if we take a look at our general ledger then the work in process is going from two million three forty nine five down by the one million eight sixteen five to the five thirty three and that of course ties out to the trial balance the finished goods then it's going to be debited so it's going to go from the six uh sixteen up by the one million eight sixteen five to the two million four thirty two five that two million four thirty two five here on the finished goods Net there then we're going to have the sale so we're going to write record the sale process that's going to happen so we have sales of 2,500,000 finished goods inventory of 176.001 so the journal entry here now when we think about the sale this is often confusing because we haven't been dealing with the sales side of things we've only been dealing with the cost so when, when we get to the end of a problem oftentimes we see the sales number and we forget the part of the journal entry that's the basic part of the journal entry way back in even a service industry has the same journal entry here which would be if we sold it on account debit to accounts receivable credit to some type of income in this case sales that's just the normal recording of sales that sales number the two million five hundred has nothing to do with the cost that we have been doing the cost process we've been doing might be used to somehow derive that number the sales price but we've been working on the actual cost, just the cost of the goods. The sales price would have to normally be given within the problem, and we'd have to derive it in real life, of course, somehow based on the uh, what our costs are. We'd have to mark it up in some way. Then we need to think about the cost of goods sold. The other half of the journal entry is, of course, taking the inventory out of finished goods and recording the related expense, that related expense called cost of goods sold. Therefore, we're gonna have to do the cost of goods sold calculation and so in order to do that, we're going to say the beginning finished goods inventory plus not purchases, but this is the 1816500 that we calculated on the last slide for cost of goods manufactured. That's the difference in the cost of goods sold calculation when we talk about a manufacturing company as opposed to just a merchandising company that buys and sells. We don't purchase the goods, we make them. We therefore have to do the cost of goods manufactured calculation in order to plug that into where the purchases normally go in the cost of goods sold calculation. That will give us the cost of goods available. Then we're gonna subtract from that uh, less the finished goods inventory. Again, they gave us, the, we're gonna, this problem gave us that information. So the problem gave us that. So we got the 176001, and therefore we're left with cost of goods sold of 2,256,499. That would be the cost of goods sold, allowing us to do the second half of this journal entry, which would be a debit to cost of goods sold of this number and then we're going to credit the finished goods inventory so if we looked at our accounts then of course we've got the finished goods inventory is going down from 2,432,500 by the 2,256,499 that we calculated here that gives us the 176,001 this is recording the entire th you know process for the for the entire period basically and uh, the debit would be to the cost of goods sold that we show here it would have a GL account, but we're not showing the GL account on this because we're just looking at the 